Hello, book club! Today's book is Dawn Shard by Brandon Sanderson. Dawn Shard is a short story, a novella, that takes place between Oathbringer and Rhythm of War. So what is Dawn Shard about? Well, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end that is all about getting to an island. This island has been mentioned in the Stormlight Archive before. There's been expeditions that have gone there and everyone has died. The story kind of begins where one of the ships went to the island, gets found on the ocean floating with no crew. They have no idea what happened to the expedition. And it kind of raises the interest in this particular lost island that they're trying to find. There's a lot of lore uh, within the Stormlight Archive that the characters are aware of about this lost island and this lost city. So their job is to go there and explore it. Now there's a lot of subplots actually going on. There's a plot to keep them from the island, obviously. There's a plot to get to the island and just find it, figure out what's there. There's a goal of finding an oath gate. And probably the most important goal is saving Chiri Chiri, which is a, a flying creature. Uh, it's hard to describe what it is. It's, it's kind of like a flying insect or crustacean. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly how to describe Chiri Chiri, but it, uh, a very interesting character. And I know it's, I know it's not a, a speaking character. I know it's a creature, but if Bella can be a character, and Bella is a character, in the Wheel of Time, then Cherry Cherry can be a character in the Stormlight Archive. Don't tell me Bella's not a character, I'll fight you on that one. And Cherry Cherry seems fairly intelligent for a creature as well. Cherry Cherry has become sick, has taken ill, and her, I guess, owner or whatever, Risen, uh, wants to save her. And that's Risen's probably number one reason for going to this island, because there's uh, allegedly this is where her species is from. Dawn Shard is a side quest. It really has that feel, a side quest, and it covers some very, very important lore for the Cosmere. Dawn Shard does a couple of other things besides expanding the lore of the Cosmere. One very important thing is it concentrates on some character development for some characters that have been overlooked in that department. Of note, characters involved in Dawn Shard are the Lopin, Lopin is his name, but The Lopin for most of the book. Risen? Risen? I'm going to call her Risen. R-Y-S-N. I'm not sure how to pronounce it. Risen. Uh, one of the sleepless. Nickly? Nickly? Nikolai? Nikolai. I'm going to say Nikolai like, a, like he's Russian. Nikolai. Um, he, he gives me that vibe. Nikolai. Huyo? H-U-I-O. I'm really not good at pronouncing names. Huio. In my head, they're just kind of whatever pops into my head real quick. I noted it that as that, and I just keep going while I'm reading. It's usually when I listen to a voice actor do the audiobook that I start to realize how far off some of the names I've given these characters in my head actually are to what the words, letters should spell out. Then we have Rushu, which is a very interesting ardent. I like her a lot. And a number of other characters that may or may not play a larger part in the Stormlight Archive as things progress. Risen is not a character that I ever really liked all that much. She started out as a spoiled apprentice. She was more interested in the shiny things than the important things. She just did not interest me as a character to follow. I thought she was actually in the books just to show you more of Roshar. She goes to a lot of different places with her her master, her Babsk, or something like that, B-A-B-S-K, I think is how it's spelled, her teacher, a master merchant that she's learning how to be a merchant or tradesman. He seemed like an interesting character. He seemed like the one you were actually following most of the time, and she was just sort of the annoying apprentice sent there to challenge him. <laughs> Although it... Looking back, it, most of the stories took place from her perspective. At some point in one of the interludes, one of the side stories that are in the main Stormlight books, she has an accident. And that accident changes the course of her life, 
But I still found her a very boring character, even afterwards. Even in the Oathbringer, when she joined the main storyline during the battle for Thaline City. The battle was interesting, her part in things was interesting, but I still didn't find her very interesting. And this, this accident that she had didn't make her any more interesting. Which just goes to show that it's not the adversity that characters face that make them interesting characters, or people for that matter. It's how they face that adversity. It's, it's how they change, how they grow. That can be interesting, what they become. And she didn't seem to become much other than, you know, dealing with the obvious physical limitations of the accident. I don't want to give too much away. I'm trying not to spoil this. So Risen was not a very interesting character to me. And I probably would have rated her individually as a 4 out of 10 to 6 out of 10 at best as far as interesting, engaging characters in a Stormlight. After this book, she's going to get a bump to a 7 looking like she's going to be an 8, 8.5. She's turning into a very interesting character. Towards the end of Dawn Shard, she made some serious changes and growth. And because of that, she's starting to become an interesting character. For that reason alone, for Risen's arc, for her character development, Dawn Shard is well worth reading. It's a very short side story, so it's worth reading for a number of reasons. One is the lore expanding, obviously. One is Risen's character development. But in addition to that, you have the Lopin's character development. Now, Lopin seems like a character that doesn't need to develop. As soon as he stepped foot into the Stormlight Archive, as soon as he, his first scene, and from then on out, Lopin's perfect. Lopin's, Lopin is the Lopin. He's like a force of nature. He's, he does not need to change. He is what he is, and he makes every scene better just being in it, just being himself. Well, truth is, he's actually in need of some character development. I didn't realize that at the time. I thought he was perfect, one of my favorite characters. As soon as I found out that the Lopin was a central character to Dawn Shard, I wanted to read it, just because of the Lopin. But he does make some great Great growth. He does have some great growth. He has to face certain unhappy truths about himself, and he has to deal with that. And it's painful. It's painful for him. And he deals with it in his traditional Lopin sense with a lot of humor and comedy and very sincere uh, moments, very sincere, heartfelt moments. But also, he's the Lopin. He is the comic relief in most of the scenes that he's in. It can be the most tense, horrific, people are getting eaten, people are dying scene. But the Lopin, if you see the scene through his perspective, you're going to see the humor in it. He's going to make jokes, even just to himself, about what's going on. Lopin is the comic relief, but underneath that comic relief, we're starting to see that he has a heart of gold as well. I mean, did you ever really doubt that he had a heart of gold? No, but now you're starting to see that heart develop into, a, or him develop into a much more well-rounded individual. Maybe that means he'll be more serious in the future, but hopefully not too serious because we we all need a little bit of a Lopin. In addition to Lopin, there's Huyo. I may be pronouncing that entirely wrong, but H-U-I-O. Huyo, sure. He doesn't really develop as a character so much as you get to know more about him. And I found him to be an interesting kind of side character before. Now I'm like, this guy's really cool. Apparently, he's brilliant. Apparently, he's a tinkerer and he likes to, and he's probably going to be a good inventor. He just hasn't had the opportunity, but he's extremely curious and I like those intelligent characters, especially the underrated intelligent characters. I, I look forward to, to reading more about and through his perspective, about him and through his perspective. Rushu is an interesting Arden. If I were to describe the type of girl that is my weakness, it'd probably be something like her. She is intelligent, curious, bluntly honest about herself and everything else around her that's going on. She seems to be fearless. I think my 
innate attraction for those kinds of people in real life is probably what draws me to her as a character. All right, let's get into rating some of this, right? I've talked a little bit about it, but let's let's really critique it. Plot. The plot is pretty standard. It has a beginning, middle, and an end. The beginning is prepping for the journey. The middle is the journey. The end is the destination. Pretty straightforward. Uh, nothing to write home about, really. It's, it is what it is. It serves its purpose. I can't get over the, f the, the feeling that this is really just a side quest. It seems like it just did not fit. It was absolutely necessary character development, absolutely necessary lore, absolutely necessary steps that needed to happen, things that needed to happen in the Stormlight Archive that just didn't have a place in Oathbringer and didn't have a place in Rhythm of War. And it needed to, it just needed to happen. A gap filler, it was a necessary gap filler. For all of that, it turned out pretty well. There are some hiccups, I think, because it was rushed, but we'll talk more about that when we get into prose. For plot, I gave it a 7 out of 10. Uh, it's probably a 5 or 6 plot, but it was executed fairly well, so I'll give it a 7 out of 10. For people, uh, for the characters, a lot of times I just, when I, when I talk about people and characters and I'm rating this, it's more about how well the characters are developed. Here, it's how well the characters develop. Interesting distinction there. My, I know it sounds the same, but I'm making a distinction. You've got the characters that you've developed for the story, and then they develop further in the story sometimes, oftentimes. And then you've got character development within the story. So you can kind of break it down between those two things. The characters as they've been developed for the story, and the characters as they develop in the story. The character development in this story is, is pretty good, so I would rate this higher on characters. The fact that Lopin's in it is going to raise it up. The fact that Risen's in it is going to drop, drop it from the get-go for me, but that changes with how well both of those characters develop, or how important their character development is. How earned that character development is as well. So where I might have scored this as a 6, because of the development that happens within the story, 8.5. Pacing is related to prose very closely in this particular short story. For pacing, I'll just say that there were parts that went a little too fast and parts that went a little too slow, and this isn't a thing that uh, Sanderson normally has issues with, but I think this project was rushed, and maybe that's the reason why. For prose, I'm going to give this a 7 out of 10 as well. Now, Sanderson prose is not something that's talk of, talked about very often because it's like a Midwestern accent. You don't really hear it. It comes at you so easily. Well, that's how his prose is. It comes at you so easily, so naturally. It flows so quickly. Think of it like this. You're rendering in your head as you read what, what's going on in the book. You're rendering it like, like a, um, a GPU, a, a graphics processor in a computer. You're rendering the story in your head as you go. So the, the, the language on the page is the program. And you can have all kinds of hiccups in the program that cause that rendering to stutter. For Brandon Sanderson, his prose is so smooth that the mo most of the time you don't notice it because the story's rendering so smoothly inside your own head. You, like I said, it's like a Midwestern accent. You don't realize it's happening because it doesn't stick out in any negative or positive ways. It's just that that perfect balance that allows you to enjoy the story without concentrating on the prose itself. And the prose can be very profound at times too. That I'm not knocking it for being vanilla or anything like that. It's just so digestible. It's accessible. It's extremely accessible prose. And I've heard that said before, but I don't think we give Brandon Sanderson the credit he's due for not being overly poetic or overly descriptive or underly descriptive. Don Shard is a little bit of an exception from Brandon Sanderson's typical prose. I would rate his prose normally as a nine because it is so easily rendered in my brain that when I'm reading, I don't have to slow down or speed up. I'm just right there. It just flows so smoothly. And that, I think, is ideal 
it's one thing to look at prose and say, well, that's beautiful, but did it help the story? I think when it comes to helping telling the story, his prose is usually spot on. Don Shard suffered a little. It suffered perhaps because it was a, a rushed project. I've heard that it was a little bit rushed to get out. And I noticed when I was reading, there were certain parts I had to go back and read again because things jumped too fast. And that's not something I normally have to deal with with Sanderson. I normally don't have to go back and read again to see if I skipped a line or skipped a paragraph or missed something as I was going because my brain stutters as it's trying to render what's going on. I stuttered a number of times. I stuttered a number of times where I'm rendering the story, I'm reading it, and I thought, there's got to be more to this. My, my brain was trying to construct the room, was trying to construct the situation. My brain was trying to fill in, and there was too much to fill in. So if I was going to grade the pros on this book as compared to every other book out there, I'd probably still get an 8. But if I'm going to grade it against Sanderson's typical pros, it's probably going to get a 6. So let's give it a 7. Just split the difference and give it a 7 for now. So when your prose is off like that, when, you're, when your brain is stuttering, when your mind, when you're constructing the, the visual in your mind palace as you read, and you, you stutter or you get bogged down on too much detail, you know, that messes with the pacing. So the prose here messed with the pacing, I think. The pacing was, it seemed a little rushed at, timed, at times otherwise, it seemed a little too fast at other times also. And I think the pacing and the prose and the combination of the two, it do does feel like Don Shard was a little rushed. Now, if you compare Don Shard to Edge Dancer, Edge Dancer is a much more polished novella, I believe. In fact, my wife has not read any of the Stormlight Archive, but she did listen to Edge Dancer with me on a car trip and she loved it. She got right into it, loved the story, it didn't leave her behind, and uh, you know she did enjoy it. That's that's pretty high praise for a novella that happens in between other books in a series. I'm not sure she'd get the same out of Dawn Shard. I think Dawn Shard might leave her in the dust a little bit. Before I give an overall rating, I think it's important to note that the lore that's revealed here, the Cosmere lore that's revealed, is so important that it's an absolute must read, no matter what score I give it. The character development that takes place is also, it makes it worth reading, definitely, but it's also, I think, going to be important for these characters in future Stormlight stories. I have not finished Rhythm of War yet, but I'm assuming that it's going to be important. But how good of a read is it in the Sanderson world? Because I hold him to a higher standard. You know, when you're the best kid in class, he may or may not be the best kid in class in your book, but... When you're one of the top grade getters, when you're doing really well in the class, the teacher's going to grade you a little bit harder. So I would give it a 7 on the Sanderson scale of 1 to 10, and I'd give it an 8. Actually, I'd give it a, probably a 5 on the Sanderson scale of 1 to 10. Nothing drops below... No, I'd give it a 6. Nothing drops below 5. 5 would be the worst thing Sanderson's ever written because it's still well worth reading. This is a little bit better than that. He's, he's come along but it's not one of his, not what I'd expect from him nowadays. When rating it against the rest of the world, I would give it a 7. 7.5. Something like that. 